Hi folks, Damon here. It's been a while. Uh, you know, I was a little bit busy with reInvent, kind of building a cool EMR Studio workshop, but also getting ready to announce something really, really exciting. So at reInvent this year, we announced a preview for EMR Serverless. EMR Serverless is a new deployment option for EMR where you don't have to worry about managing or maintaining servers under the hood. You just run your jobs and EMR takes care of provisioning all the resources you need to run your job and dynamically scales up and down while the job is running. So today I wanna to show you how to run both PySpark and Hive jobs on EMR Serverless. One thing to note, if you haven't already, check out aws.amazon.com slash EMR slash serverless, and you can click the sign up for the preview link. We're going to start letting folks into the preview soon, so check it out now and come back when you've seen the preview. One thing I will also try to do today, I'm going to try to do this all in real time just to show you how EMR serverless works and how quick it can respond to some things. So if I can, I'll do it all in real time without any skipping or fast forwarding except for maybe the runtime of the job. Let's get started. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is show how to run a PySpark job. Before I dive into the code, one thing you can do is check out the blog post where we announced EMR Serverless Preview. This goes over EMR Serverless, how and why you might want to use it, as well as some of the core concepts of it that we'll be talking about. So particularly, I want to talk about the application and the job. With EMR Serverless, you create an application and that's tied to a specific framework like Spark or Hive. And then once your application is running, you also have a job that you can submit to the application. You can submit multiple jobs at the same time, one after another, kind of whatever you want. The other thing to know about is something called pre-initialized capacity. With EMR Serverless, you have an optional feature to pre-initialize a set of workers that could be there and waiting for capacity, ready to run your job. We'll see exactly what this looks like during the demo, so I won't go into it in too much more detail here. In the blog post, we also have some common usage patterns, so definitely take it out if you want to learn more about EMR Serverless. Now let's take a look at what we're going to do in our sample app. One of my favorite data sets on the registry of open data is this NOAA Global Surface Summary of Day data set. It actually tracks about over 12,000 weather stations throughout the world and gives you aggregate details about each weather station for each day. It's kind of awesome. Uh, it gives you mean temperature. It gives you mean wind speed. It gives you max and minimum temperatures. So what I want to do is I want to write a PySpark script that actually calculates some extreme temperatures for this past year. It's been a bit of a crazy year, um, as well as a hive uh, SQL script that does the same. So let's switch over to the PySpark section. The first thing that we need to do before we get started is create an application with EMR serverless. So I'm going to go ahead and use the create application command. With the create application command, I'm also going to specify my initial capacity. This is the pre-initialized workers that I was talking about. So I have two workers that are drivers and then 10 workers that are executors for my Spark app. That means that at any given time, I'll have that amount of capacity ready and waiting to accept jobs. So I can start two Spark jobs immediately at any given time. Now that the application is created, what I'll do is I will export the application ID so I can use this in further commands. So down here, I'll do a get application. And then once the application is in a created state, which happens pretty quickly, I wanna go ahead and start the application. What that does is it takes that initial capacity that I specified and pre-initializes it behind the scenes. This can take about a minute, but you only have to run it the first time you create the application. When you submit a job to the application, it will scale up as the job needs, and then it will scale back down once the job is finished to that initial capacity. I should note that that initial capacity is going to stay running, so you will get billed for it while it's running, but you can start and stop applications whenever you want, and that will release uh, release the capacity there. So in this case, we're reserving essentially uh, two drivers with two cores and four gigs of memory, and then 10 executors, again, with four cores and about four gigs of memory. There's also this maximum capacity section that says you can scale all the way up to 200 cores or a terabyte of disk, um, just to make sure you, you can limit your resources as much as possible. So let's do a quick get application command again. And we can see that it is in a starting state. So while that's starting, I'm going to show you the PySpark script that we're going to walk through. In this extreme weather script, it's 
pretty straightforward. Uh, all it's going to do is it's going to display some extreme weather stats from that bucket. So it's going to read a bunch of CSV files. It'll do an overall count of weather readings. And then for each of these different stats, it's going to calculate uh, a different uh, column. So it'll show me the highest temperature, highest all day average temperature, highest wind gust and average wind speed, and then highest precipitation. So it just kind of loops through these different stats and then prints them out to standard out. Let's go back and see how our application is doing. It's still in a starting state. Again, this takes about a minute once the application has started as I'm going to run my job. So let's talk about that really quickly. For EMR serverless, we use this start job run command. We provide an application ID and an execution role. That role in this case just needs access to read and write to S3. Our entry point is going to be this PySpark script on S3, and that's for the Spark Submit job driver. And then you also have to specify the Spark Submit parameters. So you do need to specify the number of cores your driver will have in memory, as well as the executor cores in memory too. You can optionally specify your Spark executor instances, but this is only the number of instances that your job will start with. As the job is running, if it needs more executors, it'll actually request more executors from EMR serverless automatically and scale up as needed. So let's go back, check our application. Awesome, that's now in a started state, so pretty quick. Let's go ahead and submit our job. Awesome, so I go ahead and call get job run or start job run. And then I'll do an export of my job run ID so I can go ahead and use that for future calls. And then if I just do a get job run to check the status of the job, what we see is it's already in a running state. Awesome, right? That started pretty much as you know quickly as I could type out uh, a command line to get back. So that is starting uh, right away. While that job is running, it's actually going to log data to S3 as well. So if I do an S3 LS of the log bucket, you can see I've got this spark logs directory there. So if I do a recursive listing of that, what we'll see in here are Spark event logs. So these are all different event logs that can be used for the Spark history server. So while the job is running, you can actually use the Spark history server to keep an eye on the job. During the preview, all you need to do to run, to run that is fire up a Docker image. So down here, we've got a pre-built Docker image you can use. What you need to do is you need to have an access key and secret ID defined and session token optionally, and then export this log dir variable. Then you just need to start the Docker container with this command here. And if we do a Docker logs of that EMR serverless Spark UI container, we'll see it start to spin up. And there we go. And pretty quickly, we'll also see it start to read data from S3. So now you can see it's actually parsing the application logs directly from S3. So if I open up the Spark history server on my local host here, uh, the application is still running, so it'll be listed in the incomplete applications here. And you can see it's pulling up the history summer, summary directly from S3. So here's the application that I just submitted. I can go in here, click on that application ID, and what we'll see is the progress of that application while it's running. You can see right now, it's just listing all those uh, 12,000 CSV files from that bucket. And if I expand the event timeline here, you can see there's my initial batch of executors that kind of fired up. So I requested 10 executors initially. And if I click on the executors tab over here, we can see uh, most of those executors have already spun up and are actually processing tasks already. Once this finishes listing, I can refresh and I'll see even more executors get added to the job. The other thing to look at while this job is running, I'm just going to uh, cancel out of the logs there, is uh, the Spark driver and the Spark executor logs are also going to get sent to S3. So if I do an S3 LS of my job location right now, you can see I've got a Spark driver prefix there. And if I look inside Spark driver, you can see there's my standard error from the job as it runs. When this job is finished, I will also have a standard out there too that I can use to read the output of my job if I need to. Let me refresh the screen here one time. And now you can see uh, we've got a 
a few more executors being added to the job. So as this job was running, uh, it determined that it needed some more executors to process all that data. And you can see we're up to about 100 uh, executors added here. And that's actually hitting the max capacity of my job too. So we will continue adding executors all the way up until the max capacity. And we can see the job has started to process here. Uh, we're going into the CSV portion of it here where it's reading the file and inferring the schema. And pretty soon we'll see it start to calculate the different stats from the weather application as well. So that's going to sit there and run. I will fast forward just a second to the end of this job. It takes just a few minutes to run. So let me go ahead and do that. All right, if I refresh my page here, we can see um, there's all my different tasks that were going. They all finished pretty quickly there in a matter of seconds, and the job is now completed. So if I go back to the EMR console here, or uh, my console, and I just do a get job run, you can see the state is success. And if we take a look again at the uh, S3 logs inside that Spark driver, you can see there's now a Spark executor uh, prefix there as well. But if we look inside the Spark driver, what we'll see is there's my standard out. So if I do an S3 copy of standard out down to my local host here and unzip it, here is the output from the Spark job. So the number of weather readings in 2021 were just over 3 million, which is pretty awesome. Highest temperature uh, recorded was 129 degrees Fahrenheit um, back in June. Highest all-day average temper temperature was 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And this one is kind of interesting. The highest wind gust was 102 miles per hour recorded in the Mississippi Canyon, which is actually an underground canyon off the coast of Louisiana. So some pretty interesting stats here. That is how you would go ahead and run your PySpark job on EMR Serverless. So that job is complete. We didn't have to worry about provisioning anything. And now that it's complete, what we can also do is we can go ahead and stop our application. Again, this releases the initial capacity. So for example, if you wanted to stop the application during the weekends or something like that, so you weren't being billed for it, you could certainly do that and then just start it again the following week. So that is a quick overview of running a Spark job on EMR serverless and pre-initialized capacity. Let's see what it takes to run a Hive job. So with Hive, it's going to be very similar to the Spark application. What I'll do first is I'll go ahead and use the create application command with EMR serverless to create a Hive application with, again, a specific amount of initial capacity. In this case, we specify the Hive type for the application. Let me go ahead and I'll do that. And then I'll take that application ID and export that to an environment variable again so I can use that in my future commands. So we'll do a get application there. Again, once the application is created, then you just go ahead and start the application. And that, um, if you're using initial capacity, that makes sure that the job or the application is up and running and can accept jobs. So now it's in a created state and I'm just gonna go ahead and do start application so we can go ahead and create that warm pool of capacity. So that'll take maybe a minute or so. Um, again, you only have to run that the first time that you create the application or start the application, and then you can submit as many jobs as you want to it. Let me show you the script that I'm going to use. So I took the extreme weather script uh, that I had in PySpark and converted it to a Hive script. So you can see here, I'm using some CTEs inside of uh, my Hive script to go ahead and select the NOAA data for the year 2021, uh, pull out different information like the max temp and wind speed, and then create rankings uh, for the max temperature and daily temperature and wind speed, and then just select all of that down here. The other thing with Hive is Hive uses the Glue data catalog for um, its tables and databases. So I'm going to have another script here too that goes ahead and creates this NOAA GSOD PDS table and adds partitions to the table for each specific year. So that script will run before my SQL script there. Let's go back and see how that application is doing. Looks like it's still in starting state. That might take a minute. I'm just going to skip ahead super quick because we already saw what that looked like on the PySpark side. All right. So now the Hive application is started and we can submit jobs to it. Let's go back to our code and see what's going to happen here. So I've got a couple, I've taken those scripts and uploaded them to S3. And I'll use the same start job run command again. I'll specify Hive as my job driver. And there's my initial query file that's going to go ahead and create the table if it doesn't exist. And then my extreme weather script right there. The other thing Hive needs is this Scratchdir and uh, Metastore warehouse dir settings. These are just writing um, some temp files and stuff like that during the job. So you do need to have an S3 bucket that you can write to as part of this job. 
I do also specify my Hive driver cores and Tez uh, cores and memory, and that is to make effective use of the initial capacity. So if you don't set these, that's fine. There's some defaults that get used, but if you are using initial capacity, you want to make sure your job has the right amount of settings to fit into the initial, that initial capacity so it'll start as quickly as possible. So let's go ahead and do a start job run again. I get back a job ID, so I'm going to go ahead and set my job run ID to that. And let's see how quickly I can get to this. I'll do a get job run. And is it running yet? Awesome, it's already running, cool. <laughs> um, so that is, again, how fast something start up on EMR serverless, uh, especially if you're using initialized capacity. If you're not using initialized capacity, there can be some delay as we go ahead and procure the resources necessary to run the job. It just depends on your workload and how you want to be able to uh, respond to jobs coming in. The other thing, um, as uh, with the Spark jobs, the Hive jobs log to S3 as well. So if I go ahead and do an S3 LS of my Hive logs location, what we should see here is this timeline data. So this is timeline data for the Tez UI. So similar to Spark, you can use the Tez UI to view the job while it's running. Again, we've got a Docker container for that. You just need to set this S3 log URI as well as your access credentials. So I'll go ahead, I'll run this Docker container. I'll do a Docker run of that, and that takes just a second to spin up. So I'll do a Docker logs dash F. And the Tez UI is a little bit different from the Spark UI. It has to kind of download files from S3 on a regular basis in the background, whereas the Spark UI can read directly from S3. So this just functions a little bit differently. It's got a resource manager and a timeline server in there too that the Tez UI needs to kind of populate its data. Um, but you don't have to worry too much about that. For now, just go ahead, fire up that Docker container. And then if I start the Tez UI here, there we go. So there is my extreme weather DAG. And if I click through to that, you can see there's all the different maps and reducers that are going to run, all the total tasks. So if you want to, you can go in here and take a look and kind of see what's going on with the job. While the job is running, these different mappers and reducers are gonna change to a success state. And you can kind of keep an eye on the job as it runs or even once it's all done. Similar to Spark as well, we output the logs to S3 uh, while the job is running. So if I do an S3 LS again, um, we'll see now there's this Hive driver prefix here. And if we look in there, there's currently just the Hive log and the standard error log. So this is where you can go if you need to you know, dive in and start doing some additional debugging. Um, that standard error log is pretty similar to the Tez UI. It's actually going to tell you all the different mappers and reducers that are running. So you can kind of monitor the job as it's going on if you wanted to look at it after the fact or whatnot. So that job is going to go ahead and run again, um, just due to the nature of that job, that's going to take a few minutes to run. So I'm just going to fast forward to the end of that job. See you in a sec. Awesome. So I think that job just finished up, uh, took, you know, uh, just under four minutes for that job to run, just processing all that data. So let's go ahead and take a look at the get job run output. We can see there it's in state success. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy that standard out back down, just like we did with the PySpark job and see what this hive job looked like. So here's the output of the hive job. We can see the station name, date, and the max attributes that we're looking at. So there's the max wind speed of 85 uh, miles per hour. Again, there's the max da average daily temp of 110, and that actually happened at a few different places. And so that is the output of the hive job. And I've set that up so, um, you know, just kind of outputs that as part of the, the output of the job. So that is running Hive in there. And now finally, we can just go ahead and stop that application because we don't need that capacity anymore. So we'll stop that application and we can even go ahead and delete it too. Uh, we don't really need that application anymore. So I'll just do a stop and a delete and we're all done. That's it. And that's running a Hive application on EMR serverless. Pretty simple. Thanks so much for joining me today and taking a look at EMR Serverless. All the code samples that I showed today are available on GitHub in the AWS samples slash EMR Serverless samples repository. So go there, check it out. That's also got the Docker containers there if you need to um, take a look at those if you want. As I mentioned, this is in preview right now. Go ahead and sign up. We would love the feedback just in terms of you know what you what workloads you would like to run on EMR Serverless and you know just general feedback about the experience and how you think it is. So thank you and see you again. Bye.